so many students in particular. So I'm Marianne Kayla, I director of the Division of Arts and Humanities. I'm here only to welcome you. Um, and I am also here to say that this is co-sponsored, this Humanities Colloquium, uh, with support from the Fund for World Religion. So it's sponsored by the Division of Arts and Humanities and with additional support from the Fund uh, for World Religion. So that's um, my message. I also encourage you to eat as much as you possibly can on the way out so we don't have any leftovers. <laughs> uh, but Liz Marlowe from the Department of Art and Art History will introduce our speaker. So thanks for coming. Thank you all for coming to hear this talk, which I'm so excited for. Uh, it would be easy to introduce today's speaker with a catalog of his remarkable professional accomplishments, the awards bestowed on his many books, the wonderfully diverse range of venues in which his many, many articles have appeared, from scholarly journals such as Critical Inquiry, Partisan Review, and the Yale Journal of Criticism, to the LA Times, the New York Times Magazine, and the Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung. The enviable list of grants from institutions like the National Endowment for the Humanities, the American Council of Learned Societies, and the Guggenheim that he has received, or the visiting professorships at a series of Ivy League in, uh, universities. For the sake of due diligence, I will say that he earned his PhD, his BA and his PhD from UC Santa Cruz, where he was also born and raised, as was I, which makes him an extra special gold star speaker. Um, uh, and he is now a professor of English and Judaic Studies at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst, where he has taught since 1988. But what I really want to do with this introduction uh, is to tell you just for a moment about the impact that he made on one of my students, Lydia Messler, sitting right there, uh, in a moment in my uh, core 400 seminar, which I co-teach with Jordi Kerber from Anthropology. Uh, in our seminar, she described, uh, discussing, dis uh, discussing Professor Young's readings, she described a moment of bafflement and unease that she had experienced on a recent trip to Berlin. She'd gone to see the memorial to the murdered Jews of Europe, a Holocaust monument that opened in 2005. Prepared to be disturbed and devastated by it, she was quite surprised to see Berliners hanging out and chatting with friends, children running around and playing hide-and-seek among the monument's thousands of grim concrete slabs. Was that wrong, she wondered? Should a Holocaust memorial be so completely integrated into the urban fabric, into people's daily, daily lives, that they respond to it almost as if it were a public park and not a memorial to mass murder? Lydia told the class how grateful she was for that week's readings, and really how often do you hear that, uh, <laughs> and the eloquent case that Young had made for memorials that do more than simply cast a trauma in amber or sanctify the culture of death, to borrow his phrase. Professor Young advocates for memorials that honor and recognize the diverse needs of their diverse con constituencies, memorials that can evolve to embrace every new generation's reasons for coming to it, and that can also recall their own evolutions over time. This is the process she witnessed at the site in Berlin, the Holocaust's insistent mark on the landscape and on Berlin's consciousness, but the meaning of the trauma to this generation fluid, personal, and multivalent. James Young's own work plays an important role in this process. Not only was he a consultant to the city of Berlin during their commissioning of that very monument, he was also more recently a juror on the World Trade Center Memorial Competition. Even more importantly, he is currently at work on a book, although I hear he's recently finished it, uh, called Stages of Memory at Ground Zero, which will tell the story of that commission. To judge from snippets of it that have already appeared in print, his aim in doing so is not to air dirty laundry, but rather to document the history of this epoch-defining process and to preserve the competing visions and often clashing needs that lie behind all collective memories, but which are usually hidden from the public during official acts of commemoration and erased from historical memory once public monuments reach their final form. I'm very much looking forward to hearing more about his current projects, so please join me in welcoming to Colgate Professor James Young. Uh, 
Thank you, Liz. Um, not only are we from the same hometown, <clears throat> but we might be the only two kids from that town who couldn't wait to live in New York City. <clears throat> I actually left in 77, <clears throat> actually 76, uh, to go to Europe for two years and then ended up back up in, in New York City. Um, <clears throat> it's true that I was uh, actually on the um, memorial jury that chose the Denk Mall uh, in Berlin. We were five. A uh, complicated process, some of which you may have <coughs> read about in the class, and it's a story I told in At Memory's Edge um, several years ago. Um, <coughs> that uh, memorial was obviously quite controversial. It was fraught. <coughs> it almost didn't get built. Uh, Germany really was paralyzed with a very particular you know, problem. Um, its conundrum, obviously, is how to recall a people murdered in the national name. <coughs> and uh, how to rebuild uh, or maybe even reunite Berlin on the bedrock memory of a national crime. It's no wonder that uh, the memorial was paralyzed for so many years. Um, a very different process, <clears throat> and I'll actually get back to the Berlin process in some detail in a few minutes, um, unfolded in New York City after 9-11. Um, I'd lived in New York for 20 years and had <clears throat> moved to Amherst not long uh, before 9-11. And uh, <clears throat> within days of the attacks, uh, I was actually invited by the mayor's office and by the governor's office uh, to come begin talking about how to memorialize the attacks and the victims of the day. And my answer was very swift and clear. You know, it's not really memory yet. <clears throat> it was still unfolding you know, as an historical event uh, before our eyes. Uh, the only ones who had really a lock on memory were the families <clears throat> who had lost lo loved ones. Um, and uh, their losses uh, were quite concrete and, uh, and meaned, obviously, uh, meant, meant uh, just the world to them. So they knew what they had lost. But the rest of the country, the rest of New York City, you know, it just had lost buildings and property. And it lost its sense of security <clears throat> and had been violated. You know, a sense of uh, violation ensued. So we talked about all these things, <clears throat> and eventually, um, as the process uh, continued to unfold, I was invited to uh, take part as a juror. Uh, it was a 13-member jury, along with Maya Lin <clears throat> and Vartan Gregorian, Michael Van Valkenburg, great landscape architect. And um, we chose uh, a design reflecting absence <clears throat> by Michael Arad and Peter Walker, <clears throat> two gigantic voids um, built in the footprints of the World Trade Center towers. Um, fountains, actually waterfalls coming down the edges of all, all sides, and two further voids at the very centers <coughs> of each of these footprints. They're gigantic. They're 200 feet square. <coughs> um, the, the plaza itself is covered with uh, white swamp oak trees, uh, which will continue growing to about uh, 40 or 50 feet high, um, so that as they grow and fill in, the volumes of the voids will actually increase. <clears throat> they will seem to be deeper. And as the buildings continue to be built up around it, the whole, the whole plaza area will now really present as one gigantic void with two further voids inside and then two further voids inside that. Um, a real preoccupation uh, with negative form. And um, we weren't allowed to talk about it any of the process while we were kind of sequestered uh, for about nine months. <clears throat> we actually were announced on April 27th in uh, 2003, and we uh, gave them, we presented the winning design on January 5th, 2004. Um, as soon as we announced it <clears throat> and provided a rationale for our choice, um, selected by the way from 5,201 design, submissions from 62 countries around the world and from 49 states. Uh, all but Alaska, for some reason, saw fit to submit you know, something. Although Sarah Palin, Sarah Palin seemed to have a lot to say about the Islamic Culture Center that is, you know, is now being planned for a couple blocks away, but uh, didn't have much to say apparently about the 9-11 attacks themselves. Um, the first question I took <clears throat> is from a, a reporter who had known my work in Berlin, had known my books, my discussions of what I called counter monuments, <clears throat> uh, 
especially in Germany, the negative form monuments built into the ground, invisible monuments, uh, gigantic voids, marking absence. And uh, <coughs> said simply, um, so we know you were on the jury in Berlin, you chose the, the Denkmal by Peter Eisenmann. Um, we know that you've worked closely with uh, Daniel Liebeskind um, on his Jewish Museum project, a project which is um, uh, kind of dependent on the void, six voids, which he's built into it. You've um, kind of defined the term negative form monument and counter monument. Um, haven't you just really chosen another big old Holocaust monument for downtown? The first question I had. <clears throat> and at first I took slight offense, um, but then I began to formulate a response, <clears throat> um, a little bit like my whole life flashing before my eyes. I could kind of, and I, I wanted to figure out <clears throat> how to answer tactfully, but how to deny that this was a big Holocaust monument. <clears throat> Um, but in fact, as I began thinking back, um, I thought back to um, Maya Lin <clears throat> and a conversation I'd had with her uh, at the Graduate School of Design at Harvard in 1987. Uh, we had been invited to give a kind of a, a presentation on, on memorials when Boston was trying to come up with its own Holocaust memorial. And we just wanted to put into context what Holocaust monuments looked like around the world. And um, Maya Lin wanted to unpack her process for the Vietnam Veterans Monument. And she told me at dinner that, in fact, um, the Vietnam Veterans Monument owed a great debt to two other memorials, one of them a Holocaust memorial. <clears throat> one was Edwin Luton's uh, memorial to the Battle of the Somme uh, in France. And the other uh, was the, this memorial right here in Paris. Uh, which was dedicated in 1959, designed by Henri Pangouchon, uh, a French uh, architect, who <coughs> built um, really one of the very first, I'd say, horizontal memorials here uh, to the Holocaust. This memorial is to the uh, deporté, or to the Jewish deported, Jew, uh, Jews deported from, from Paris uh, during the war, most, most of whom died, some 90,000 were killed uh, at Auschwitz. <clears throat> and what he did here was to take a, a kind of a horizontal form. There's a little red triangle garden in front of it, denoting really mostly political prisoners. <clears throat> uh, but this was the, kind of the French understanding in 1959 that Jews were regarded both as, in some ways, uh, you know, racial victims on the one hand, but also political on, on the other. And to get into the uh, space, you have to descend this very narrow uh, staircase, <clears throat> a stone staircase. Um, and while doing this, in fact, the whole city kind of disappears. <clears throat> so you have to go down. The city disappears. There's one little spire right there of Notre Dame. This is on the Ile de la Cité in Paris, which is the same island with, the, uh, with Notre Dame. Um, many people, I just had a, a puzzled look, have been to Notre Dame and wouldn't even see this because it's actually um, almost invisible. You know, it's, it's kind of, it's in the ground. But you come down, and, and he basically wanted you to feel um, a, somewhat oppressed, but also isolated. He wanted to build, um, take a, a, kind of build an absence into the ground. He took uh, kind of these abstract uh, triangle forms and would suggest maybe a barbed wire fence with it. Um, the only way out when you're down there, the only view out, is through this, um, <clears throat> this kind of grilled window. And what's really interesting is that if you're across the river from this memorial, it looks like the prow of a ship, kind of cutting through the river scent. And so you go right up to the, the little windows right there on the tip of the elbow, and you have to bend down, and then you can look across the river sand and see the boats, the boats going by. And what Maya Lin loved about this memorial, she said, um, uh, she was a senior at Yale uh, when she won the competition uh, for the Vietnam Veterans Monument Memorial, uh, an open and blind competition that received over 1,000 submissions uh, from around the world. <clears throat> but what she really loved about this was that it had carved out a place in the ground. <clears throat> and she knew, she said, after visiting this memorial, that any memorial she designed was going to be a carved place in the ground which would open up a space within us. It was really important that we descend, in, descend into this space, that the space be opened up to receive us, 
And then what we remember is, in fact, is what we bring, the, the knowledge we bring to this site. This was her pastel drawing her submission for the Vietnam Veterans Memorial, <clears throat> you know, submitted in 19, uh, 1980. And um, here, she obviously counterpoints all of the very traditional and conventional memorial's you know, main, main features. Instead of creating a positive form in the landscape, <clears throat> she's opened a form up. Instead of taking a very traditionally aggressive um, jutting elbow, which is kind of the military flying wedge, she's taken not this jutting elbow, but she's taken this opening embrace, the crook of the arm, which now invites us down into it. So it's completely counterpointing what has traditionally been this great military um, you know, the wedge formation and has opened it up to create kind of, if you will, even a, a, a pacifist and receiving space for us. And sure enough, uh, it was built. It was uh, voted unanimously uh, by the jury at the time. And uh, one leg points to the Washington Monument. The other leg points to the Lincoln Memorial. So it does integrate <coughs> itself into this landscape on the one hand. But on the other hand, it also counterpoints all the, you know, kind of the, the huge, um, you know, monolithic uh, <coughs> uh, you know, spires, the neoclassical uh, marble, the white marble, with this black shape in the ground. And she said she didn't want to make a wall. What she wanted to do was to create a wound in the earth and then open it up. It's like taking a knife, cutting it into the earth, and then opening it like that, so that the wound would come now to <clears throat> you know, represent a, a very wounded country, a country whose memory of the Vietnam War was itself quite wounded, a country which, in fact, um, did not receive the wounded vets back from Vietnam uh, you know, very kindly. Uh, it was a, still a very fraught war, a war that Americans had now come really to abhor. So she was faced with this problem, how now to remember a war and to remember veterans um, whom we don't really want to remember, <clears throat> how to remember the great ambivalence we feel about this war. And she arrived at this um, America's first and I think greatest counter memorial form, counter monumental form, which would now counterpoint all the very traditional uh, kind of memorial vernaculars. So th this is kind of running through my mind <clears throat> as this guy is asking me whether we just chose a Holocaust memorial. And so my answer <clears throat> ended up being, well, um, no, we didn't choose a, a Holocaust memorial, but in fact it's quite clear that the Holocaust um, <clears throat> and World War II have begun to inflect all kinds of memorial vernacular, all kinds of art, all kinds of literature, all kinds of philosophy, a huge preoccupation after the war around silence and how to articulate silence without filling it in, space and absence and how to formalize those spaces and absences without, without somehow filling them in with, you know, with meaning, how to um, build, uh, how to remember something without assigning it consoling meaning all at the same time. And these were all the issues that Maya Lin you know, was dealing with here. Um, the only forms in this very abstract memorial are obviously the, the reflections of those who come to visit uh, because, in fact, uh, these memorials by themselves don't remember anything. <clears throat> they depend on the interaction, the social interaction that we bring to them. You know, the memory exists in these sites only in kind of that dialogue between the visitors and the forms themselves. And here we actually get to see them. The names on the memorial are arranged, as you may know, uh, chronologically. <clears throat> not, not alphabetically, but historically. <clears throat> At the very crux of the memorial um, is where the very first soldiers died, and then as you move out it's, it's, and get to the very ends, it's when the last soldiers died. So you can look them up, and if you know the year in which they died and the date, you can actually locate them that way. Um, she didn't want to create, you know, kind of a telephone book of, you know, uh, 83 Johnny Joneses, but she wanted every Johnny Jones to be re-embedded in that moment <clears throat> in which he, he was killed. And you're right, the guy wearing the Red Sox hat there is my older son. <laughs> <clears throat> so... That was my, my short answer, <clears throat> but as I was kind of formulating that answer, um, <clears throat> I wanted to put it into more context and look at the ways, in fact, that um, mm -hmm. there is this 
this memorial arc between the Lutens' memorial design in, in Battle of the Sun, my Lynn's Vietnam Veterans Memorial, and the counter monuments <coughs> in Germany. Because once my Lynn's memorial opened up, the Vietnam Veterans Memorial opened up, a new generation of German memory artists and architects suddenly realized <coughs> that it may be possible, finally, to find a vernacular that might articulate your great ambivalence about remembering a particular set of events. And they saw, they saw the potential in this negative form. They weren't copying Maya Lin, but now they understood <clears throat> that if an American ar architect could articulate America's great ambivalence about the Vietnam War and its vets, that maybe there would be a way for German memorial artists and architects to begin commemorating a, a war and a, you know, a mass murder <clears throat> um, you know, that they also ab abhorred. <coughs> Um, how to create this and create a, a memorial legacy um, in a way that has never been done before. And so they ran a competition in 1995, huge competition, received some 526 submissions from around the world uh, for their national uh, memorial to the uh, murdered Jews of Europe, what would you know, come to be called the Denkmal. One artist, Horst Hoheisel here, proposed taking the Brandenburger tour and <clears throat> blowing it up. <clears throat> That is how to remember a now absent people except with a now absent national monument. <clears throat> Rather than creating a, or constructing another edifice, maybe you need to remember destruction by destruction, by destroying Germany's national monument in this case. And, and he also realized that this was never actually going to be done, but that too was part of this proposal's point. Maybe this shouldn't be done. Maybe there should be just ongoing competitions. There's a, there's, you know, let the process repeat itself over and over again, and, and, and that will become the memorial, just the debates on what a memorial can do and what it can't do. Um, let us ask these questions endlessly, and in that way, you know, the murdered Jews of Europe will be remembered. This, this is probably fairly familiar to any of you, you know, kind of <coughs> been following German memorial designs. Um, I discovered this just a couple months after it was dedicated in 1986, <clears throat> uh, meeting the artists uh, while giving talks in, in, in Germany. And uh, Jochen Gertz and his then wife, Esther Shalev Gertz, um, proposed, a, 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 actually won a competition in Hamburg uh, for a memorial uh, against war and for peace, um, basically uh, uh, against violence for peace, it was a, a Holocaust memorial. <clears throat> and um, they met in Israel at a, a huge exhibition <clears throat> in 1983, uh, in fact, when uh, Jochen had begun thinking about this memorial competition and, and proposed it to Esther um, just a few weeks after they met. And she said, um, in Israel we have so many memorials, um, I say um, we should make one that goes away. Now, enough of the memorials already. Let's make one that disappears. <clears throat> and so they worked on making a memorial that disappears. So sure enough, they proposed this memorial, this 12-meter tall lead-covered column. <clears throat> and then we invite the citizens of Harburg and visitors to the town to add their names here to ours. In doing so, we commit ourselves to remain vigilant. As more and more names cover this 12-meter tall lead column, it will gradually be lowered into the ground. One day, it will have disappeared completely, and the site of the Harburg Monument against fascism will be empty. In the end, it is only we ourselves who can rise up against injustice. And in this very you know, minimalist design and this quite eloquent uh, you know, caption in, in eight different languages, including Turkish, Arabic, Hebrew, uh, Russian, English, German, um, <clears throat> they articulate... Uh, there are problems with the traditional memorial. In the end, it is only we ourselves who can rise up against injustice. They had begun to suspect already that memorial making might be, become a substitute for action in light of memory. And that they wanted to build something that would re return the burden of memory to those who come looking for it. Um, they worried about something even then that I remember thinking about um, uh, a few years later, in 1993, when the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum was dedicated. I remember Elie Wiesel taking the, uh, the podium and then interrupting his dedication speech to turn back to President Clinton and uh, Hillary sitting behind him 
and saying to them in 1993, but Mr. President, before, <clears throat> before I go back to re you know, remembering the Holocaust, you must do something about the genocide of Bosnian Muslims now in Bosnia and Herzegovina. It's happening right now. I can't sleep for what I, my eyes have seen in Bosnia and Herzegovina. He actually did a kind of a, a visit and found, in fact, emaciated bodies behind concentration camp, you know, wire. And, uh, and so he brought that message back to the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum. And then I watched this on TV, and the camera then panned to President Clinton, you know, who clenched his jaw and his eyes began to water a little bit. And uh, he was very touched by this. <clears throat> but then I heard him say something that he didn't actually say, but I heard him say in his mind that, Ellie, I am doing something about the, Bos the Bosnian Muslims. I'm here with you remembering the Holocaust. And no, it's exactly the opposite. You remember the Holocaust in order to do something about the Bosnian Muslims. And in Germany, this is basically what happened when it came to Kosovo. Uh, again, part of the German Denkmal uh, debate, which I'll, I'll talk about in a few minutes. So here, instead of taking, you know, kind of presuming to build a monument that will last forever, this memorial will disappear by inviting its violation, you know, adding our, your, your names to ours here. And as every meter and a half section is filled up, it gets sunk into the ground. And of course, what happened? <clears throat> yeah, within weeks, you got a scribble scrabble, you have people taking magic marker pen, <clears throat> um, you have funny faces drawn, and occasionally you would get the swastika now even carved into it. And, and the town, the mayor of Hamburg was, uh, was outraged. He said, um, we, maybe we should get rid of this monument. It's, it's become a trap for graffiti and all kinds of filth. And the artist replies simply, you are getting rid of it. Just keep signing your names and it will disappear. And so between 1986 and 1993, in fact, as they began, as people added their names, it would, it would be a sinking. The artist took great delight in the spectacle of Germans sinking their anti-fascist memorial. Yeah. But what they didn't like about conventional memorials was that they regarded really most memorials as kind of a fascist architecture. To them, to remember the victims of fascism and what they regarded as a very authoritarian form of art and architecture, gigantic stones telling people what to think and what to believe and, you know, and, and how to make meaning, stones that would pretend to be there forever, said, no, <clears throat> they're, they're ephemeral, they go away, they're, let's make our memorials as, as ephemeral as the memory we would have them call up. So sure enough, and of course I could ask you <clears throat> to guess on what date <clears throat> the final sinking took place, November 9th, <clears throat> 1993, uh, Kristallnacht, or the commemorative commemor day for, for Kristallnacht, um, which was also a day <clears throat> that I, I actually discussed with um, former Chancellor Helmut Kohl, was kind of Germany's national, built-in national day. Um, on that date in 1918, uh, Wilhelm uh, abdicated uh, after World War I. Of course, that became kind of a Veterans Day or, or Mrs. Day for the, the Allies. But on that date in 1923, Hitler launched his putsch, his attempted takeover of the government, as a commemoration of Wilhelm's abdication. And then Kristallnacht in 1938, of course, was, was started on that date um, as a in a way, a bit of a memorialization of the attempted pooch. Um, and of course, what day did the wall come down? 1989, November 9th. Um, it, it became the day. So, you know, Jochen and, and uh, Esther were very happy now to dedicate this memorial on November 9th, 1993, four years after the wall came down. So the search <clears throat> for kind of a, a counter-memorial form <clears throat> was certainly informing, you know, the memorial downtown, the 9-11 memorial. And um, with every uh, new monument in Germany, I would say between 82, when the Vietnam Veterans Memorial was, um, you know, was first was dedicated, and I'd say right up to the present minute, <clears throat> um, these questions, you know, how to articulate lost without filling it in, how to suggest absence, <clears throat> you know, um, Without, without actually filling it in, how to formalize these, pro these, these qualities. Um, Jochen Geritz was take, take a, took a job <clears throat> in Saarbrücken um, at the Institute of Fine Arts there and taught a class in memorials. 
he asked his class to take a kind of a vow of uh, uh, confidentiality and then asked half the class to go out and steal cobblestones from throughout the town and then the other half <coughs> of the class to um, uh, research the names of every single uh, Jewish cemetery destroyed in Germany between 1933 and 1945, some 2,162 uh, Jewish cemeteries destroyed. So <clears throat> they took the cobblestones out of this big uh, plaza here out of the out of the kind of the, this this schloss had been actually the uh, Gestapo headquarters in World War II. <clears throat> they took these back to the classroom and then they carved the names <clears throat> of every Jewish cemetery in them 2162 of them dating actually when they did it. And then they took these cobblestones back to the site <clears throat> and installed them in the plaza without telling anybody. Um, but of course, this being a class by Jochen Gertz, they installed the stones inscribed side down <clears throat> so that there was no record of the entire operation. <clears throat> it was basically a pedagogical exercise for the students. And then when they announced what they had done, the townspeople came out to see the memorial. And this is now called the, you know, the, the, the Invisible Memorial, <clears throat> memorial to uh, uh, 2,162 uh, 2, stones against racism. And uh, when the townspeople asked the class, well, where's the memorial? The class answered uh, quite didactically, I'm sure, um, look within yourselves for the memory you come to find here. The memory is in you. And uh, again, keeping this in play, it was meant to be all process, meant not to be resolved, meant to be you know, provocative, um, and, and it works. Now, a lot of people ask, so what happens when um, you've got a land of, uh, of nothing but invisible monuments. Who will then actually remember the Holocaust? And, and, and they would just reply that, um, look, at as long as you continue doing these projects, and we have records of them, um, these won't be the only memorials we have, but these memorials are meant to counterpoint the kind of the complacent certainty that traditional memorials have had. <clears throat> and we cannot be certain about our memorials to the murdered Jews of Europe. We have to constantly you know, see in these memorials kind of a, uh, <clears throat> what they call a, a, an annoying stone, you know, something that gets in under the skin, um, ending up with memorials like a, there's a great one with, you know, going on right now <clears throat> uh, by Gerhard uh, Demning called the uh, Stolpersteiner, which some of you actually may have tripped over you know, throughout Europe now, in which he has been researching the homes of murdered Jews, <clears throat> in beginning with Germany, and then um, researching when they were deported and when they were killed, uh, and then inscribing these on small uh, brass, uh, they're like little brass cobblestones, which then he plants in kind of a little ceremony right in front of the house from which, they're, um, from which they were deported. Um, Stolpersteiner or, or stumbling stones. You're literally in Germany meant to stumble over this memory, you know, even accidentally. You don't need to go looking for the memory. It's just going to come up and get you like this. Horst Hoheisel, who had proposed you know, to blow up the Brandenburger Tor, um, proposed another memorial for Kassel in 1986 at exactly the same time the Gerritses were building their disappearing memorial in Harburg, and that neither, neither artist knew what the other one was doing. Hoheisel, again, taking his cue from my Lynn, decided to not to reconstruct this fountain, the Ashrod Brunnen, um, which had been destroyed by the Nazis because it was a Jewish uh, uh, donor who had donated this to the town hall, uh, but Hoheisel proposed taking the form and then building it into the ground. And instead of water coming up in these fountains and um, spitzing up, you would have water fill this little channel and then pour down into the ground so that, in his words, um, the only positive form standing here will be the people who come looking for memory. That he wanted not to create a standing memorial, he wanted to create a horizontal space that would now accommodate us who come looking for memory. So that this would be like a pedestal for the people. Again, returning the burden of memory to those who come looking for it. This is another project that I described in other places. <clears throat> Micha Ullmann, an Israeli artist uh, who was also in the same show that uh, Esther and Jochen were in, in Israel, um, a show which, uh, by the way, I would, I would call Israel's first counter-monumental uh, exhibition, 
<coughs> they wanted to take the Triple Door uh, Monument in uh, Tel Chai and to counterpoint it <coughs> by inviting some 30 different artists to create um, uh, permanent memorials surrounding and, ca and counterpointing and even challenging this national memorial at, at Tel Chai. Uh, Esther Shalev did one. Uh, Micha Ullmann um, was at that time experimenting in various earthworks and uh, his memorial was a, um, a, a ditch <coughs> that you would descend into so that you would see only sky, but now through the, uh, with the ragged edge of the sod uh, around you. And so for him, it, it was basically a place to look at sky, but through a cut in the earth. So this, this generation, 82, 83, Maya Lin, Michal Ullmann, uh, Esther Shalev Gertz, are all thinking in these terms so that when uh, they held a competition in Berlin for the book burning memorial to commemorate um, the Nazi book burnings of 1933 and 34 at the Babelplatz right across from the opera, uh, Michael Ullmann won with this design, and this design is called Bibliothek, it's a, or library. <clears throat> um, on either side of what you see in the middle here is a window. He has uh, descriptions of the book burnings themselves, and then a quote by Heinrich Heine, uh, the great German-Jewish uh, poet who wrote in the early 19th century that where books are burned, so one day too will people be burned as well. <clears throat> um, the only standing forms on this plaza are not memorials, but are the people who come now to look down into this window, and this is what they see, <clears throat> a room full of empty bookshelves. <clears throat> the books cannot be compensated. They're lost forever. Just as the people who wrote them, the ones who were murdered, cannot be compensated. They are now lost forever. You would now articulate loss and absence with further loss and absence and create a space where the only standing forms are the people who now come looking for the memory of this, uh, of these events. Rachel White Reed in Vienna <clears throat> also created a memorial um, called Bibliothèque or Library. Rachel White Reed is best known perhaps for winning the Turner Prize uh, in England for her 1984 uh, <clears throat> row house, which was going to be, which was being torn down, and um, she proposed an art project in which she would fill it with concrete, fill the whole, all, the whole empty, all the empty space within a row house with concrete, and then take away all the, uh, the housing material so that you're left only with the spaces now articulated by material. Um, for her, she said that uh, material is always an index of absence. This is her, her phrase. Uh, a little bit like Bruce Nauman uh, in the 60s, uh, trying to articulate the spaces underneath tables and chairs, and this is something Rachel White Reed has also done. So she proposed articulating the space between the leaves of books on a bookshelf and the wall. So it's taking that empty space, articulating it with concrete. It's almost like taking the, the library room and turning it inside out. And so that you could run your hand along this and you'd, you'd feel like basically the edges of the leaves of the books as you ran your hand around it. And again, she won this competition uh, unanimously. Uh, much discussion around the memorial, highly controversial in Vienna. This was Vienna's first um, the tr tr you know, national memorial uh, to the murdered Jews of Austria. Um, <clears throat> at first, some of the townspeople um, said, oh, well, in fact, we already have a memorial, and this is called the Judenplatz, after all. And um, when excavating the site for the memorial, in fact, they found the remains of a synagogue um, which had been destroyed <coughs> in uh, 1521, a, uh, the result of a pogrom, an auto de fe, in which all the Jews in this neighborhood were burned alive in their synagogue. And those remains were found on this site. So this, the townspeople said, why don't we make that the memorial you know, to the Holocaust? <clears throat> and of course, Rachel Whiteweed answered, well, have you seen how those Jews are commemorated? And she took them next door to the church, uh, where she uh, pointed out this uh, tapestry uh, which explained that <clears throat> in 1521, the flames of hatred rose up against the Jewish dogs to punish them for their crimes. That was how the, the, mass, the, the pogrom was explained in Latin in this church. 
So once they realized that, oh, wait, we don't really want to remember it that way, <clears throat> they allowed her to go forward. But she, they moved this, uh, this kind of cenotaph over a little bit, so you have both some of the remains of the, of the, the synagogue <clears throat> you know, from the 16th century pogrom and the current memorial to Austria's murdered Jews. But again, articulating absence, formalizing loss without filling it in has become the preoccupation just as it was with Daniel Liebeskind in the Jewish Museum in Berlin, using voids to interrupt a seamless narrative <clears throat> you know, that would kind of put together again Jewish history in Berlin. Uh, Shimon Ati, American, <coughs> California-born uh, artist, um, <clears throat> moved to Berlin in 1990 um, after the wall came down just to do art. <clears throat> Now, he'd done different kinds of photo-related art in San Francisco, including a project he did just before leaving for Berlin in which he took all the photographs of his friends in the gay community that had been taken in his apartment. <clears throat> um, and after they died, he projected these same photographs back onto the very walls, sofas, kitchen, dining sets where they had once sat and then invited people to come remember them as they lived. So he was already doing this with the photo installation of the um, kind of the, you know, the AIDS crisis in San Francisco. And then he moved to Berlin. And as he walked around this neighborhood, the Schoenenviertel uh, in Berlin, kind of right uh, in, in the middle, just of what had been the um, uh, Alexanderplatz uh, neighborhood, uh, he realized that he didn't see any signs of the um, Ostjuden who had been living in this neighborhood between the wars. Um, many of them forced out of Poland, uh, many of them stateless Jews, mostly in the, very, in the early and mid-30s, you had um, thousands of them living in this neighborhood. So we began doing research and found uh, their pictures of their bookstores, of their bakeries, of their theaters, um, took these photographs, um, turned them into slide projections, and then without telling anybody what he was doing, he would just show up and project these photos back onto the sites where they were originally taken in the late 20s and early 30s. And he had uh, uh, basically some 70 images like this projected on, on all different nights uh, around Berlin. And then he took photographs of these images. And of course, he hoped that um, once you turn the slide off, once he, once he turned, took the light away, that these images would now be burned into the mind's eyes of those who saw the pictures. So that basically you've internalized these. And this was Jochen Gertz's point about art also. He goes, I, I want to make art that changes people inwardly so that when the art itself disappears, the changes remain inside of the people who have seen this art. And uh, Shimon Ati now would also do the same thing. Turn it off, and once you've seen this, of course, this building will now be seared by the memory of what had once been here. Um, the effect is quite striking. It's almost like, um, like you're pulling away layers and seeing kind of this palimpsest underneath you know, for the uh, Jewish bookstore, Hebrew bookstore here, <clears throat> or kind of a Jewish theater. Uh, actually, this is a, a bakery here. And here's the theater. And here he's reminding us, of course, that by themselves, these buildings actually don't remember anything. They only remember what we bring to them. They remember, in this case, what he projects onto them, what his mind's eye now projects onto these buildings, that they demand the interaction with you know, people who come to visit. <clears throat> so <clears throat> fast forward to um, 1997. In 1995, <clears throat> the Berlin Denkmal competition uh, uh, found a winner, <clears throat> uh, kind of a, a horrible design by a Berlin-based uh, team of architects. Uh, they proposed a 100-meter square slab of concrete, three meters thick, tilted like this, um, three feet off the ground, or three meters off the ground here, like 10 meters off the ground on its other side, scattered with 18 boulders imported from Masada and inscribed with 4.2 million names of murdered Jews. Uh, I mean, it's wrong on so many levels, it's even hard to know where to, you know, where to begin. 
<coughs> uh, why 4.2 million names? Because that's all the names that um, even Yad Vashem says it's going to be able to recover, but you, you can't suggest a number, kind of an unhistorical number like that. The 18 boulders from Masada, of course, to import imagery of a, uh, the Masada you know, story, <coughs> which was a, were a band of zealots in 77 uh, in the common era, uh, <coughs> hold up in this Masada kind of fortress, um, waiting for the Romans to come and take them. The Romans spent several years building ramparts up, and then they were going to come and take them as slaves, the last Jews after the fall of the temple in, um, uh, in Jerusalem <coughs> in, uh, in 70, in the common era, going to take them back to Rome. But rather than being enslaved, they committed mass suicide. Uh, I've seen about 700 uh, of them committed mass suicide. So here you're going to remember the Holocaust in the image of a mass suicide of Jews of Masada. I mean, that makes no sense. All these things went on. Um, I was asked to comment. Lots, everybody was kind of asked to comment. I wrote op-ed pieces for the German papers. And finally, Helmut Kohl uh, just threw up his hands and voided the entire competition. And got to start over again. And the Germans were, um, they were frustrated. They were humiliated. Um, the, the spectacle of all the bickering and the back and the forth thing and the, and the, and the bad design they, they had chosen was really kind of humiliating for the committee that had chosen it. Uh, the committee composed of uh, five members of the Bundestag, five members of the uh, Berlin Senate, and five members of the so-called uh, Photokreis, or a, kind of a citizens' initiative uh, committee. So they didn't know what to do. <clears throat> and when the Germans don't, don't know what to do, they at least asked the right questions. <clears throat> and they held a series of symposia <clears throat> at a, a huge uh, assembly hall in what had formerly been East Germany, East Berlin, um, and they asked me to come and give the final keynote talk <clears throat> about Germany's memorial problem. Why have we failed so spectacularly in our attempt to create a national memorial to Europe's murdered Jews? And I've been thinking about it quite a bit <clears throat> and had even uh, kind of art, you know, written about these counter monuments as somehow successfully confronting Germany's memorial problem. And I said that you're trying to do something that nobody else has ever done. No country has ever created a national memorial legacy around its victims, always around its own martyrs, only around its own destruction, only around its own triumphs, but never around those people it had victimized. And then I asked them, this audience of maybe a thousand people, including parliamentarians, where in Washington, D.C., where on the mall is there even one little pebble commemorating the Middle Passage? or slavery in America? What about the slave auctions that were held on the mall in Washington, D.C.? Do you see even one little rock or tree remembering this? No. America is not building its own memorial legacy on, on slavery, and in fact, it's doing almost nothing to remember it. I mean, only very recently are we beginning to ask these questions, in fact. <clears throat> and I said, you're trying to do something that nobody's ever done before. <clears throat> and uh, if you can actually pull it off, um, you might actually be you know, shining a beacon for other nations and showing other nations how to remember crimes committed in their national names, too, uh, because nobody else is doing it. <clears throat> so I said, um, in fact, I'm not even sure you should do it. <clears throat> I said, maybe you, should, maybe you should have a thousand years of Holocaust memorial competitions rather than any final solution to your memorial problem, is my, my, my parting words. And... <clears throat> This has included a slideshow of Germany's counter monuments, uh, discussions of Israel's national memorials, America's memorials, and Poland's memorials, showing that every country had its own national memorial problem in a way. And, um, <clears throat> and this is, these are the ways they dealt with them in Israel, America, and Poland, among other places. And so um, the next day uh, in the German papers, there was a picture of <clears throat> Germany lying on the sofa and and a drawing of me taking notes in the chair behind the sofa, and the window open and the, and the drapes blowing out a window, you know, for, like, fresh air. And, uh, and I said, I'm serious. Just, just keep doing the competitions. And so I got home, and within hours of landing, the, uh, Peter Radunsky, then Speaker of the Berlin Senate, uh, called me to ask if I would now chair a new jury <laughs> for the memorial. And I said, well, actually, I don't think it can be done. And I don't, don't even think it should be done. You know, you've already got hundreds of memorials. Berlin's full of memorials. 
You know, maybe you don't need to make a big central memorial that will take the place of everything that you've already done. And they said, precisely because you don't think it should be done, we want you to help us do it. <clears throat> so I couldn't resist the logic. And I agreed, knowing that um, <clears throat> I would try to articulate a process in such a way that could provide for no memorial being found. And I told them that. I said, I'll agree, but only if you agree that we may not find a memorial. That we'll do a process. And in fact, instead of finding an answer, maybe we just will find a memorial that articulates the German conundrum. How to reunite Berlin on the bedrock memory of national crime, and how to remember a people murdered in the national name. Nobody's ever done it before, so let's just start, keep those questions in front of us and try to articulate those formally. So we were allowed to invite <clears throat> 25 artists. There were five jurors. We each kind of negotiated on the five artist architect teams we would invite. <clears throat> One of the teams proposed this memorial to Europe's motor Jews, taking a kilometer of the A4 Autobahn, not, uh, not far from Kassel, and paving it over in cobblestones. So you'd be racing along at 160 kilometers an hour, and then you'd have to slow down to 30 kilometers an hour, bumping along, no doubt cursing the memory of the Jews with every bump, <laughs> and, then, and then race away. They didn't want people to kind of voluntarily come to these sites, but they wanted you, know, you to be turned into a pil pilgrim, whether you're going to work or visiting a family or on holiday. You're just going to run into this memory you know, at a very inopportune time. We actually loved this design, but we didn't choose it because it wasn't um, meant for the, wasn't meant for Berlin. But this was one of the teams we asked Reinhold Martz and um, <coughs> Friedrich Schmerz. This memorial was proposed by Daniel Liebeskind, and this was one of three, two finalists, three finalists. Um, <coughs> what we liked about this design was the way he allowed the site to run over into the tear garden across the street. And that left corner, in fact, points right <coughs> to the uh, Goethe monument in the, in the Tiergarten uh, in Berlin, which we liked a lot. The broken wall itself uh, um, was interesting to us, um, except that it was meant to kind of link itself to the Jewish Museum. <coughs> um, voids in this wall pointing toward the voids in the middle of the, uh, of the Jewish Museum. And um, we also had kind of an allergy to the notion of one architect, Danny Liebeskind, now being responsible for both the Jewish Museum and the uh, Bank Mall um, is, is too much. Having an American architect, now American architect, solve all of Germany's problems uh, was very problematic to us. <clears throat> um, this design actually won three first place out of our votes out of our first five votes, or out of five votes in our first um, uh, poll, by Gesina Weinmiller, a young German architect, <clears throat> who um, proposed, again, think of the Maya Lin design. This is built into the ground. She's taken 18 segments of limestone wall, <clears throat> uh, meant to reference the Kotel, or the, the Western Wall in Jerusalem. She seemed to have arranged them somewhat randomly here, um, but you would descend into the space, and as you descended, of course, Berlin's sights and sounds would kind of disappear, it would get quiet, and then everybody would find their own way in and around these, you know, s s kind of pieces of the, uh, of the Kotel, uh, as it were. We noticed as we walked around the model, and if we got to this corner right here and looked in, that these seemingly randomly arranged segments actually began to compose uh, Star of David, Mug and David, and as you walked away, the star kind of fell apart. <clears throat> and she didn't tell us about it, but we noticed it. And uh, we kind of liked it, but then we worried that it was a little bit gimmicky. So you know, back and forth we went. Um, I actually voted for this first because I actually wanted a German artist or architect be, to be doing this. Um, I felt in some ways I was even being used politically as an American to, you know, an American Jew to give them cover you know, on the jury. And it was much was written about my role in the jury as kind of a, a fig leaf, you know, um, you know, they, they could either blame if things didn't work out, or I could, uh, you know, kind of ratify it, you know, and give kind of a, an American Jewish blessing on it if it did work out. Um, but eventually, I'm sorry, we voted to 
build this, <clears throat> a design by <clears throat> Peter Eisenman and, <clears throat> and uh, Richard Sarah. Um, they entered this competition uh, together. We invited them both, and they wanted to team up. And um, we loved this because it was, in fact, a kind of a waving field of wheat. It was meant to be uh, completely underdetermined. People would have to find their own ways in and out. Originally, it was conceived with 4,200 concrete stella, ranging from uh, ground level to almost uh, 27 feet high. Clearly, it would be very dangerous. <clears throat> and uh, we talked a lot about uh, the danger posed to kids running out over the tops of these and falling. Uh, when we raised that issue with Richard Serra, he said, yeah, but all of my work is dangerous. This should be dangerous. Yeah. Memory of the Holocaust in Germany should be a dangerous activity. You know, and he goes, physically, that's what I make. Peter Eisman, on the other hand, said, well, you know, we can make it smaller. <laughs> <clears throat> you know, I'm the architect. You're the client. You know, if you want an extra bedroom, I'll make you an extra bedroom. You know, so they actually had a, uh, a falling out as we discussed the need to shrink this whole design um, to create a space around the edges and actually to make these, um, the stelle smaller so that the design itself wouldn't be so bombastic. You know, on the one hand, we love the, the way they seem to be articulated individual uh, tombstones and the ways that instead of a kind of a military tombstone stands perfectly erect, this now seemed to be moving. Every one of these was you know, three degrees off plumb so that the whole thing seems to be moving and seems to be somewhat disorienting. A deconstructivist architect, uh, Peter Eisenman, you know, proposed this in, in classes of his on memorials uh, at Cooper Union. This was the, the space, um, a five acre, you know, 20,000 square meter space, um, which coincidentally is just about the same space of the bathtub, uh, oh, the, the space at ground zero uh, where the buildings had come down, almost exactly the same number of square feet. This uh, was a uh, this is a photograph of the site before 1989, and you can see that the Berlin Wall literally came ran right through this site. That where uh, coal now that Berlin was reunited, planned to build this memorial, was actually kind of a no man's land. It was full of minefields, barbed wire. Uh, several East Germans had died right in this neighborhood trying to uh, scale the wall where they'd been shot by guards. <coughs> um, this is also right next to Hitler's bunker. <clears throat> if you follow the East German flag right to the tip of the pole, right at that tip was Hitler's bunker. <clears throat> and that was where Hitler's remains, uh, burned remains, were found by the Red Army um, as they, they came into Berlin right here. And of course, um, there's no memorial to Hitler's bunker except for finally just this last year because people were always looking for it and they always knew exactly where to find it with the GPS. So you could always find Hitler's bunker by looking at the gaggle of tourists, looking at their GPSs, that, that it was right here. <clears throat> um, there's even a, a German um, son of a, <clears throat> a slave laborer and a Nazi mother who makes it his pastime to draw the sofa where Hitler and Eva Brown committed suicide um, and to look and to draw pictures of the door leading out of the bunker and exactly where Hitler's remains were found um, so that everybody would know. He draws it all out in chalk and then of course every day he has to come back and you know, it rains, the chalk is washed away and he has to do it again. So he was doing that so finally the city has now put up a sign. But this is how close it, everything was. I mean everything's packed in together here. So Eisenman uh, kindly shrank kind of the size of the, uh, of the memorial down to 2,711 stelle from 4,200, creating spaces around it, buffering it from the city a little bit. <clears throat> and the sizes went from 27 feet high at the maximum, now they're about 8 or 10 feet high. And you can still get lost. Um, this became a huge political football in the 1998 <coughs> uh, elections in which this is now regarded um, as Helmut Kohl's memorial um, because yeah, it was his government that had chosen the jury that ended up choosing this memorial. We, we chose this for them. And so Gerhard Schroeder <clears throat> didn't want to make it and his uh, culture minister, uh, <clears throat> Michael uh, Naumann, also didn't want to make it and proposed making a library instead. 
But SDP actually won those elections, <clears throat> and even though they were sworn to not building this, when they won the election, they went to put together a governing coalition, and they needed uh, <coughs> uh, uh, Fisher, <coughs> the um, uh, head of the Green Party, to put together a, a green-red coalition, and he agreed to join the coalition only if the memorial goes forward. So now to put together a governing coalition, they had to have the head of the Green Party, who was eventually made the, um, uh, the foreign minister. So they began construction, <clears throat> and we actually were asked uh, how to describe what it was we were recommending. We said, just take three votes in the parliament. Vote yes or no, do you want to go ahead with the memorial? Yes or no on the Eisenman number two design, that is the, the scaled down version. And yes or no on a place of information to be built underneath because this was, after all, a very abstract memorial. Um, it doesn't look like a Holocaust memorial especially. It doesn't look like anything on top but perhaps you know, resonating um, kind of a, a deconstructed uh, cemetery. And so that the memorial itself is now anch anchored in very hard history. <clears throat> and so they did vote these issues straight up and down, and uh, the memorial uh, was funded, it was approved, and it was finally dedicated in 2005. Meanwhile, <clears throat> of course, um, the Serbs are just about to begin a campaign against the Kosovar Albanians, the last Muslims left in Europe, in Kosovo. And uh, Clinton was putting together a NATO coalition to go after them, after the Serbs. <clears throat> and <clears throat> Fischer decided that he would now approve for the first time ever German soldiers and planes leaving German soil uh, to go to fight in another country. This had been forbidden in the German constitution, post-war constitution. But we would make that exception because he said, what good does it do to build a Holocaust memorial to remember the Holocaust in, in the middle of Berlin if we don't actually do something now to prevent a new genocide? It was just about to unfold. And it would have unfolded if NATO hadn't in fact stopped it you know, with warplanes bombing the Serbs um, in 99. So this is where this, you know, this whole um, kind of the, the, the complex between a memorial, memory, and action, you know, would kick in. This is, well, it was under construction, and of course, <clears throat> this is how it looks now. And in fact, as you enter it now, the city sounds and sights, you know, do disappear. You're quite disoriented. People do use it as a public park because it's a public space. And we were asked, well, what, what, what will happen? Uh, how do we protect it you know, from being abused? And I said, well, you could put armed guards outside, or you just remind everybody what this is, and, and people will comport themselves as they will. And how they comport themselves will now become part of other people's memory of, this, of what happens here, other people's experience. So most are respectful, but in fact, kids do run up and down. You know, people have picnics on their stones. <clears throat> there, there is a little sign asking people, you know, not to run, not to bicycle, you know, not to jump over the tops, you know, between these stones, but they do. And I just think the, the brilliant insight here is to anchor <clears throat> the very abstract design with a very hard historical exhibition below, and they suggested this interpenetration of the stele above by creating the illusion that they had come into the space now, so that you have the memorial space above seeming to define his, the historical space below, the historical space below anchoring the abstract design above. And this is something actually that the 9-11 uh, Memorial and Museum uh, learned from. And right now we have this, the National 9-11 Memorial Museum is built underneath the, um, uh, the memorial at ground zero. You now, sure enough, they ran over the tops. So it was with these things in mind that in 2001, uh, when I was being asked, sorry, how to remember, my, my answer was that um, it's already being remembered. Three weeks afterwards, the families remember their lost loved ones. <clears throat> um, literally, they say 1.4 billion people around the world watch the towers collapse live on TV. 
It was the most broadcast catastrophe ever. And people, of course, remembered what they saw. And then they remembered the experience of being with people, watching people's faces collapse as the towers collapsed, as they reported on it, watching. And I said, why don't you reconceive of what you're calling the 9-11 memorial <clears throat> as a memorial in stages, beginning on the very first evening of the attacks. <clears throat> Candlelight vigils set up all over the city at Washington Square, Union Square, on the Brooklyn Promenade, you know, across the, across the river. <clears throat> <clears throat> candles, of course, are very traditional, consoling uh, memorial form. You think of the, the, the yard site candle we light on the, in, in Jewish tradition. I said, in fact, oh, why don't you think of this almost in, in, in kind of this Jewish traditional way in which for the first seven days after the loss of a loved one, <clears throat> yeah, you said Shiva, for 30 days you observe a period of shloshim where you don't go to parties or have weddings and men don't shave. You don't get haircuts. And then one year after, uh, on the Hebrew calendar, uh, you erect a matzeva or a tombstone and so that you've had a chance to internalize the memory before now externalizing it again and articulating it you know, in the landscape. Consider all of these stages part of the memorial, part of what it means to internalize and let the memorial begin here. And then I said, let the further stages include all these flyers thousands of them all over the city put up by families of people missing in the attacks. And of course, these people weren't just missing. I mean, there were people who didn't come home on the one hand, but for, for two-thirds of the people in the buildings, um, there was no trace ever found of them. They were completely atomized when the, when the towers came down. And I said, these already read as kind of ephemeral tombstones. You know, have you seen my mother? Have you seen my brother? Have you seen my sister, you know, Stacy? And, and they give details, what they look like, and how many children they had, and who their brothers and sisters and parents were. And just, just almost like a tombstone, but now just as ephemeral as the lives themselves. And uh, these were up all over town, <clears throat> and they've saved huge sections of these at the museum now. But already, the motif is established, <clears throat> missing absent, loss. And this, this motif was established within the very first days, just like the you know, missing, missing. Towers are missing from the landscape. Um, Art Spiegelman's uh, drawing for The New Yorker the week after <clears throat> of uh, kind of the, the shadows of no towers. I mean, just the, the towers now gone, just with the memory of their, you know, the, the, the black shadows uh, on the cover of The New Yorker. So this sense of needing to rebuild on the one hand and to commemorate loss on the other and to do both simultaneously was basically the tension built into the 9-11 memorial process from the very first days. And we talked about it. The families knew what it meant. The kind of the, the politicians took a little longer, you know, to get it, but they did eventually. And then they weren't even sure at first. Well, are we commemorating the loss of the towers, or are we commemorating the loss of life inside the towers? And there was confusion, as as I think people conflated both of these. The firefighters knew exactly what they lost: some 426 firefighters uh, who went in to save the people. And of course, this became a huge issue. Do we now commemorate the firefighters in kind of a privileged place? The people who went in to save people while the others were fleeing, um, who did their, you know, their, their civic job while everybody was trying to get out, these rescuers. And uh, we did end up uh, finding a way to denote them uh, by putting their ladder companies. Uh, all the rescue, rescuers who died, uh, they got either a precinct number or a ladder company name uh, by their name just to note that they actually had died. Their losses were both civic and personal. Their families remembered them actually as firefighters who died as firefighters, even before they remembered them as fathers and sons, dying as fathers and sons. Along the way, you know, Mary, Mary Giuliani at first wanted to keep kind of things as they were. And um, you know, Liz reminded me, yeah, the markers of destruction alone, we felt, was always a, a, a huge problem. Rather than remembering that the horrible moment of destruction, remember the lives that were lost. But I said, this too is part of the stages of memory. 
These are all stages. And the, the cleanup, the recovery, the rescue were all stages as well. A lot of people wanted to leave these, you know, kind of the, um, the tridents, <clears throat> you know, kind of the, the, the facades of the buildings standing. But, of course, they all came down. The firefighters, of course, loved this as the monument right here, a piece of uh, iron and up in this cross is the way they cut it. And in fact, this uh, was moved out and is now moved back to the periphery of the site. And so this will now become part of the overall uh, plaza. On the six month anniversary, <clears throat> they installed Tribute in Light, first called Towers of Light, but renamed in deference to the families who wanted to remember the people and not the towers. And this was originally designed <clears throat> by, the, by these artists as a celebration, it was supposed to be like birthday candles on top of the World Trade Center towers to celebrate their 30th birthday. Design uh, commissioned by Creative Time in uh, 1998 or 1999. Um, not knowing, of course, the towers would come down and now they end up commemorating the, the towers themselves. As part of our recommendation on the jury, we ask that these be shown every year as part of the memorial. And, and they, they, they have been. So on the very first anniversary, by the first anniversary, in fact, the whole area had been completely clear, cleared out. Two reflecting, small reflecting pools were put in uh, at, at bedrock, and family members would read the name of their lost loved one and then bring a flower down to bedrock and throw it on the little pool. So <clears throat> this notion, while they're doing this, of course, there's new building staging, buildings being chosen to, you know, to be built around here. Competitions for the buildings are, are, are underway. You can see the slurry walls that the architects venerated as having withstood the, you know, kind of the, explosion, the explosions of the towers coming down and, and holding back the harbor waters. And then there was the question, what comes first? Rebuilding or the memorial? <clears throat> and so in fact, these are the, there were two finalists for the World Trade Center site design competition. <clears throat> this one by the think team of Frederick Schwartz and Rafael Vignoli proposed rebuilding the scale of the towers, but doing it with scaffolding and allowing the offices only to come up to about the 60th floor or so. Um, critics kind of liked this. Uh, architectural you know, writers um, uh, liked it. And the Lower Manhattan Development Corporation, whose motto, by the way, was um, you know, rebuild, renew, and remember, they liked it. <clears throat> but Governor Pataki hated it, and the families hated it because it looked like death. It looked like a skeleton, they said. <clears throat> and so Pataki deferred to the families and made the executive decision to choose another design altogether. But what was interesting about both this design by the think team and the, the one by Liebeskind coming up, both articulated the footprints <clears throat> and as memorials and both created these big um, voids, in a way, at the very bottom of ground zero. Even though they weren't being asked to do that, they included memorial components voluntarily. Liebeskind won the competition with this proposal, <clears throat> first called Vertical World Gardens, <clears throat> you know, Liberty Tower, and of course, you know, it's quite prosaic, um, the asymmetrical spire echoing the Statue of Liberty, the torch. Uh, the families love this design. Uh, Pataki made a summary, executive summary decision uh, to choose this one over the critics' uh, vote for the, for the other one. The critics weren't happy, <clears throat> but the families were happy. And the families actually took a privileged position in all of this. They, um, they were listened to first throughout the process. Liebeskind articulated with saw the footprints here, <clears throat> but then he basically also created a huge bowl into which now a new memorial uh, competition would have to fit another memorial, a little bit like Russian dolls, you know, nesting dolls here, which was clearly a problem. And he also encumbered the north footprint on the left here <clears throat> with a cantilevered uh, culture center, um, hall for concerts and art. <clears throat> um, which uh, <laughs> the first day of the jury as we met, uh, Maya Lynn and Michael Van Valkenburg, two of the architects on the jury, went over without saying a word and picked this up 
and carried it off into a closet, <coughs> put it in the closet and closed the door. And said, okay, now we will continue. <coughs> so the inglorious end of Lipskin's culture center, culture hall here. <coughs> so Anita Contini was appointed in August <coughs> 2002 um, to head the memorial process. And in April 2003, we were announced as a jury here at the World Financial Center, the, what was then called the Winter Garden, uh, completely reconstructed, you know, brand spanking new. And you can see Patty Harris and Maya Lynn. Patty Harris was the deputy uh, mayor. Maya Lynn, of course. <coughs> uh, Susie Friedman, head of the Public Art Fund. Vartan Gregorian, head of the Carnegie Foundation. And they had chosen basically a, a jury of both professionals and people they hoped would be kind of unimpeachably authoritative in their opinions, and who got along really well. We all kind of knew each other you know, well before. <clears throat> so we announced on April 28th, um, by August 1st, actually by the, uh, July 1st, we had received 13,800 registrations from 90 countries, and by August 1st, deadline, we received 5,201 designs uh, on standard foam core boards delivered to a secret place in Midtown on 30th Street where they were all coded with barcodes so that the designers would remain anonymous. In August 2003, uh, we were sequestered and uh, looked at 600 designs per day, <clears throat> voting any design that got even one vote would be advanced to the next stage. <clears throat> um, we all had passion votes <clears throat> so that after a couple different stages, um, even if something received no votes, um, one passion vote of ours could advance it. Because Maya Lin reminded us that her design had been advanced through that competition on a series of one member of the jury's passion vote. He wasn't sure why it was great, but he knew it was great, and he kept advancing it until he could explain to everybody why it was so great. And so she said, you know, I'm the result of an open blind competition with a juror who had a passion vote. So yeah, we, we included that in this process here. Probably the most difficult part of our process was uh, three different times we did public hearings where we were put on a stage, introduced, and then we would listen for four hours as family members told stories of their, of their lost loved ones. And our job was only to be informed by their loss, not to do anything about it, not to make design, design decisions, but just to know their grief and loss and be informed by it. And maybe the most painful and, uh, part of this process was just you know, devastating for us. But that was how, in fact, our process was informed, and the family members' um, stories um, played a huge role in what we eventually ended up with. Now, we agreed to serve on this jury only by <coughs> getting reassurances from the governor and the mayor that if we didn't find a final design, that would be okay, too. And they, they grimaced, and they didn't even want to think about that. But they said, if you agree to that, then everything will be fine. But if he tells us we have to find something, then there's going to be a problem because then, then we're up against fear and we're choosing in, you know, from a kind of defensive fear posture and not because something is great. Um, once a week, we met with the mayor over lunch and uh, about every two weeks, met with the governor over lunch. You had Maya Lynn and Michael Van Balkenberg talking to them, talking to the governor, who was great. And we actually needed to hear from him that he wasn't going to veto our decision and that he wouldn't choose something else. <laughs> and he said, no way. Uh, this is you know, completely your, your job, your baby. Uh, I promise you know, whatever you choose will be what, you know, what we build. And thank you. And then, of course, we realized that politically that was very smart because if we chose a bad design, we could get the blame. And if we chose a good one, he could get all the credit for helping run a process that worked. So that was fine. And we knew we were being used politically. Uh, Pataki brought the Republican National Convention to New York uh, later that year, 2004. <clears throat> 
By November, we had eight finalists. <coughs> um, Mayor Bloomberg gave Gracie Mansion over to us. He wasn't living there anyway. He was living in his own townhouse. And uh, we had all of our meals here, and we had the artist teams come in, and now we met for the first time the actual artists who were blind to us before. <coughs> um, if it weren't for the mayor's wine collection, we never would have gotten through this <laughs> process. Uh, there were long days, often from 8 in the morning until midnight, <coughs> several nights, meeting with the artists, giving them um, kind of intervening actually, making suggestions, and then they will come back with new drawings and new models between November and December. And then finally, in January, uh, we felt that we were down to three, and uh, we just stayed at Gracie Mansion until we finished and could choose one final design. One of the three finalists was this design by a French team <clears throat> proposing a field of blossoming fruit trees over this whole expanse with the footprints um, articulated by a mille de fleur garden, just a wildflower garden. Um, in its simplicity, that was fantastic. <clears throat> we loved the idea of kind of the, 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 the kind of the, the pastoral elegiac turn and um, Planted trees, of course, in many traditions uh, are a great way to remember life with life and to uh, create a space that you actually have to nurture and keep alive, just as we need to keep memory alive. But then this team, every time we suggested a, a, a change, they came back and made it 10 times more complicated. Then they came back and they put big glass walls around the footprints and said, no, we only want the family members to be able to go into the meal de floor. And said, so you're gonna put family members in the middle of the floor behind glass walls, like in a big vitrine, so everybody can look at them through, you know, through glass. Uh, it makes no sense at all. And so it turns out that they were a little bit difficult to work with. <clears throat> and we ended up not choosing a design that many of us actually liked most of all. We just love the way that, you know, the, the cycles of the year, <clears throat> you know, kind of tell, would, would be reflected in, in here. The cycles of birth, regeneration, you know, going fallow, going dormant, and then you know, being reborn in the spring, um, a very traditional you know, kind of pastoral elegiac mode. Second team uh, was a German team. They called this the Memorial Cloud, in which they took the footprints and sodded them over, but then took glass tubes and turned kind of one whole big space into a huge lake of glass which is quite spectacular on the one hand, and it complemented nicely uh, Santiago Calatrava's uh, winged transit center, big glass bird about to take off right next door. The design architects on the jury liked it very much. Um, Michael Van Balkenberg, a landscape architect, and I and Maya Lin did not like it uh, because we felt that it was so eye-absorbing and so spectacular <clears throat> that it kind of took us out of ourselves, and we wanted the space that would actually take us back with inside ourselves. It had no memorial logic to it that we could you know, discern. And what memorial logic they ascribed to it was in the memorial cloud, this would have a glow at night, the way that the kind of the pile of rubble glowed at night for the first several months of kind of escaping gases and dust. It was pretty horrible. So we chose this design by Michael Arad. <clears throat> and it's earliest iterations, I'm going to show you something. Here, we announced it. We went back and forth quite a bit, and there were several interventions before we even got there. After we announced it, Liebeskind went back and drew his, his buildings now with the voids in the center. <clears throat> but Michael Arad, <clears throat> uh, an Israeli American whose dad had been an ambassador actually to Mexico and to the United States from Israel, who had studied at Dartmouth and then uh, did his master's in architecture at Georgia Tech, was now designing uh, police office facades as a very junior architect downtown. But he lived uh, about eight blocks north of Ground Zero, and he watched the towers come down, completely devastated, haunted by this. and. Um, he drew on a little sketching pad within, he says about a week later, he drew this drawing. 
for him, the memorial would have to be in the harbor where he would take the exact scale of the towers and build them that build them into the river, into the harbor, just like a dream he had. <clears throat> Three weeks after the attacks, on his rooftop, he built this water table to see what it might look like. Two big voids with water rushing down the sides in the middle of the river at, at the Battery, Battery Park. This was way before any memorial competition was even being contemplated. But he had this idea, and we learned this, of course, in our very first meeting with him when we got to meet him. What we chose at first was this board. This was one of eight finalist boards. Um, people could go down into the galleries below and look up at the sky through the falling water we, we liked. We hated this big open plaza. We felt that that was the greatest weakness of the World Trade Center towers when they stood, completely inhospitable to any kind of life in the summer or winter. So we asked him to liven up the plaza, and he came back with these little trees. I said, no, that, that won't do either. And then he came back and added this, like, what ended up getting called Motel 8 um, building for a culture center. Said, no, Michael Van Valkenburg just went up to the model and moved, moved that over, <laughs> moved that away. <clears throat> and then we said, Michael, um, we love the minimalist design, we love the voids, <clears throat> we love the water. Um, we like the galleries underneath, but you need um, to team up with the landscape architect. <clears throat> your, cho your choice. And he went out and he found Peter Walker, who might be uh, America's greatest uh, landscape architect who works a lot in Japanese gardens, <clears throat> lots of water. And he has all kinds of landscape gardens in, in Japan. He's the chair of the Berkeley, uh, UC Berkeley's architecture, landscape architecture department. Peter Walker proposed taking an abacus grid of trees so that <clears throat> when viewed from east and west, you would see the city streets in neat, neat rows. So you have the city grid, but when viewed from north and south, you would get a random grove of trees. So you have both the natural form and the city grid form now interpenetrating, which is quite brilliant, I and mean, we love that. And that's when we knew that Peter Walker's addition to Michael Ross' design uh, was going to win. And uh, we eventually, after about 10 hours of kind of pretty you know, difficult voting, um, we, we got there on uh, January 5th, I think was the day. January 4th was the day that we finally got there. <laughs> and we announced we had a winner. And it was then, <clears throat> of course, that I got uh, the, that question. Haven't you just chosen another Holocaust memorial design. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and my answer was that, you know, Michael Arad went to architecture school and just 10 years ago. <clears throat> he had, in fact, read At Memory's Edge and the Texture of Memory. He much admired Maya Lin's drawings and uh, the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. He knew all about the counter monuments in Germany, that, in fact, contemporary architecture is inflected by memory of the Holocaust, <clears throat> just as contemporary philosophy, poetry, art, uh, and music are inflected you know, by memory of the Holocaust. So this is not a Holocaust memorial, but uh, all of architecture is now informed by Holocaust memory. So with that, I'll stop, and if uh, you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer them. Thank you. Any questions? Yes, Ariane. At what point in the process for the 9 11 memorial was the snow had a design for the museum approved? Was it integral from the beginning? Um, no. You know, the museum uh, came along in 2005. <coughs> it looked like the whole project was kind of crashing in on itself uh, because expenses were, you know, you know, spiraling out of control. They estimated that the memorial, as, as accepted, was going to cost around $1.2 billion to make, be a huge thing to sustain. <clears throat> so they took the galleries away, and they decided that by taking the galleries away, space underneath would now be opened up, just like in Berlin, for a memorial museum. And <clears throat> um, 
but the Memorial Museum would be built underground, but they did want some kind of a, a, a shelter or a, um, an entryway, an atrium, through which you would enter, and that was when Snow Hato was uh, uh, won a very small design competition you know, for that design, um, including taking two of the Tritons you know, and then putting uh, kind of the glass atrium around them. So that was probably chosen in 2006 or so. So this, this design uh, would be, or this version, computer version of the design, uh, was probably from 2008 or so, you know, right here. So they were just brought in to do the atrium? Just the, just the atrium. So the excavation and the rest of the Everything else was you know, being done by the LMDC, and then, of course, they had a memorial process. They appointed Alice Greenwald to be the director of the museum. She assembled a, a great team, um, you know, to you know to chart the narrative and, and to curate you know, the exhibition down below. Um, it's done it's done amazingly well, but it's so big and so full that um, the critique you know I would make of both the memorial and the museum now is that they're both huge, but you can't get away from the fact that they're commemorating something that was also big, so that their monumentality is defined by the monumentality of the towers themselves. There was no way to shrink them down. And um, uh, part of the mandate was, in fact, to articulate the footprints and to leave them unencumbered. And in doing so, you're going to have just huge, huge um, memorial pools. I mean, so the water, of course, is kind of a great you know, symbol of life, you know, the source of life itself. Um, instead of coming upward, um, you know, kind of a festive way, of course, it, it's sinking. It also recalls kind of a falling motion. And we were worried that that was going to be a little bit read maybe too literally. That yeah, was falling towers. But there's something also reassuring in the sound of the falling water. And it also um, makes the space more intimate because you can hear conversations with people, you know, five or six or ten feet away. But you don't hear the city sounds, you know, so that in this big space, um, you, you almost have like this, um, you know, little cones of silence. Where, wherever you go, so you can be intimate uh, on the one hand without being, being overwhelmed by the city itself. Um, it was really important to restore uh, this whole site to grade so it wouldn't be a gigantic pit. We wanted people to be able to eat lunch here, sit under trees, sit on benches. Um, the names arranged around the parapets, um, actually, This is the dedication uh, with Obama. <clears throat> the names are arranged in such a way <clears throat> that um, what the architect called meaningful adjacencies, and this was going to be like a, a huge debate, but <clears throat> they found uh, an algorithm by which every family was asked who, whose name should be next to their loved one's name. Family members, office mates, maybe it was a, a ladder company, fire company. Everybody said, these are the names I want my, my lost loved one to be near, and they found a way to do it. <clears throat> uh, very difficult. Um, uh, an architect uh, working with uh, Michael Rod <clears throat> uh, actually came up with the, the algorithm you know, by which to do it. And um, so in addition to everybody now being surrounded by the names of those they wanted nearby, you have uh, rescuers uh, with their ladder company or precinct office or um, number next to their names to denote that they were both civic loss as well as a private personal loss. This was on the dedication um, itself. <clears throat> of course, 10 years to the date. Everybody worried that it was happening too fast, but 10 years is actually a fairly respectful distance between, you know, my Lynn's monument was unveiled only seven years after the end of you know, the Vietnam War. Other other questions? Yes. Were the names always part of the memorial design? Because it, I mean, it seems to reflect a lot of what Obama has in the Vietnam Memorial, but I know that he doesn't necessarily include it in other monuments. They were originally, they were supposed to be on parapets of below grade. Um, the, the families were very happy when the galleries were kind of taken away. Uh, Michael Arad was very unhappy because that was part of his design. <clears throat> but they were very happy now that the names would be brought to the surface so that they are, you know, right along 
That's the first thing you see as you as you come in. But he had proposed that the names be included and also randomly, and what he always called meaningful adjacencies. And it took a little bit of time to figure out what exactly he meant by that, <clears throat> and we weren't even sure it could be done, but eventually it could be done. Sir? Yes? You said, um, well, almost never does one memorialize one's uh, victims rather than famous ones and martyrs. What projects do you know of that might actually be reversing that trend, aside from fairly? Um, I don't know if you read the Times Magazine uh, a couple weeks ago, a story about this <clears throat> uh, a, a southern lawyer, <clears throat> uh, Alabama, who is now, not uh, Louisiana, who has now bought a, a former plantation. And I don't know if you know, you know, plantations are now used kind of for formal proms and for parties, and they, they're dressed up to make them look just like they looked you know, before the war. <laughs> <clears throat> and yes, yeah, very unsettling. <clears throat> um, no mention made ever of the slaves' quarters or anything. So he's turned it into a museum of slavery. And he tells the complete story of slavery, including um, all the slaves uh, who had worked on that plantation and who had died. He, he names them all there. He, he, he did it himself, you know, hiring an historian. Um, so that's, that's one. We, we're going to have the Museum of um, African American History you know, uh, part of the Smithsonian complex on the mall. I think it opens next year. It's under construction right now. And, you know, that was related, actually, to the Holocaust Museum opening. Because, of course, the Holocaust Museum was very controversial when it was proposed. You know, why are you remembering <clears throat> what happened to a people in Europe, you know, here? And, of course, the answer was that these are now new Americans. <clears throat> you know, the, the, the experiences and events that drove these people to these shores you know, are really a part of American history as well. And that way, you know, Jimmy Carter also wanted to make sure that the liberators were remembered so that, you know, remembering the Holocaust in America meant remembering America as a land of refuge, uh, a land of liberators, uh, the land of the people who defeated the Nazis, of course. So there's something self-aggrandizing about the Holocaust Museum here. But <clears throat> um, uh, Gus Savage, a congressman from Indiana, um, asked kind of a plaintive question after the opening of the museum. It was great. <clears throat> so Holocaust survivors have a Holocaust museum in Washington, D.C. Where's, wh where's the museum to African Americans and slavery? And just let that question hang. And the answer was coming right up. I mean, so the Holocaust Museum actually provoked, you know, have a necessary response. Now you must remember actually people enslaved on this, on this continent. And, and who built America. I mean, American history, America doesn't exist, you know, without the slaves and without the millions who died in Middle Passage and all that. So, a um, little bit unrelated, but there's a huge Turkish uh, German population, you know, in, in Germany right now. Um, they've now been studying how Germany commemorates the Holocaust uh, my friend Michael Rothberg and Yasmin Yildiz, his wife, uh, actually a German Turk, um, are now studying the way that Turkish Muslims living in Germany, citizens of Germany, uh, remember the Holocaust. Because now they're returning to Turkey instructed in how a nation recalls a mass murder perpetrated in its name. And this, this German Turkish generation, which is now coming back to Turkey, to move the government to begin to recognize the Armenian mass, the Armenian genocide at the hands of the Turks, and of course, yeah, you know, the official line is that there wasn't one in Turkey, but everybody knows there was, and um, so it, it takes that generation to come back, you know, to Turkey to introduce. This is how a country commemorates its victims, <clears throat> and it will, yeah, you know, we'll see where it goes from there. Yes. There are some positive events that have happened recently that people want to commemorate, and I think in Germany, uh, the Peter Triangle. Sure. And uh, those competitions are two official competitions, and I think both have been failures. Mm -hmm. So is there a way to do positive events today? Or it's, it's pretty hard. I mean, they, they don't want to be seen. <clears throat> this is a generation.